In the book of Deuteronomy, in the 33rd chapter, we read the final blessing which Moses gave to the children of Israel just before his death. It appears in the form of a poem in some editions of the Bible. In the blessing of Asher is a well-known passage. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. This thought appears in many places in the scriptures and is beautifully stated in the opening lines of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, therefore can I lack nothing. Senior Knox, in his translation of the blessing of Moses, renders the passage which I quoted first as follows. There on high is his dwelling place, and yet the eternal arms reach down to uphold thee. There is a slight difference in translation and in the figure of speech used. In the first, we have the suggestion of a constant state in which underneath are the everlasting arms. And in the second translation, the eternal arms reach down to uphold. The essential thought that there is available is the support of the almighty arms of God, the arms of God, is put forth in both translations. However, there is a considerable difference between the constancy of the everlasting arms being always underneath us and the eternal arms reaching down to uphold. I personally prefer the first translation which established the idea of a permanent condition while the second one suggests a slightly less positive situation. While I may be laboring the point slightly, still I think it suggests the difference between the basic attitude of the Roman viewpoint and the prevailing Protestant one concerning the imminence of God. And there is considerable difference between God always being present and his intervening only on certain occasions. The liberal Catholic Church's view is that God is both imminent and transcendent. This is to say that he is both present in his universe and at the same time above, at the same time above and beyond it. The Orientalist would state the case by saying that God is both being and non-being, manifest and unmanifest. Dr. Paul Tillich uses the phrase God as God, which he probably derives from the Hebrew Yahweh, or the Lord that is Lord. When the Lord appeared, or rather spoke to Moses from the burning bush, he is quoted as saying to Moses, I am the God who is. Thou shalt tell the Israelites, the God who is has sent me to. The whole question is quite involved. However, I want to stress the thought that we are always and ever sustained by the everlasting arms of God. Perhaps this conclusion may not be important or even interesting to many, but to me it is of the utmost importance. Most importance. And I am sure that it is also true of the majority of you. We have only to give momentary reflection to the thought that there are really no everlasting arms to see how terrifying it would be to many. What would life, what would life mean without the imminence of the Creator? The materialist who thinks of himself as an atheist appears to manage quite well without any conviction that there is a divine order behind the visible universe. I deeply question such an attitude as being adequate to produce and sustain no happiness or even strength of character. We know that where there is lacking a deep conviction of an ultimate purpose in life, there is usually a laxity in maintaining the essential restraints in all relationships. It is easy to slip into attitudes and conducts which disregard the well rights of others. The philosophy of every man for himself usually leads to the corollary that the devil take the hindmost. In principle, this is entirely opposite to the spiritual principle upon which all decent and law-abiding people base their lives. lives. It is, of course, opposed to the Christian philosophy of love thy neighbor as thyself. I have given a rather long introduction to the thought I want to stress. 
Life among men has in our time reached heretofore unbelievable peaks of comp or unbelievable peaks of competition in every sphere of our lives. While we give lip service to the Christian doctrines of charity and brotherly love, in practice our society acts upon the anarchical principle that there is no purpose to existence. The great lack of discipline which exists in every walk of life indicates all too clearly that for the most part the average man and woman care nothing at all for the rights of others. Honesty appears to be at a premium. It also seems that literally every man's sword is turned against his brother, to quote Ezekiel. My conclusion is that the basis for this condition is a lack of surety in the divine purpose of life. The fear which is raging in the hearts of men today is not primarily a fear of atomic bombs or war, but stems from a deep inner lack of security and purpose in life. The paramount need um, is the re-establishing of the lines of communication between ourselves and God. Without these lines being open, we are indeed lost in the wilderness of greed and confusion, which is so oppressive in the world today. We must come to know that the eternal God is thy refuge and under the everlasting arms. For without this inner knowledge we are incapable of meeting the stresses and strains which are steadily mounting all around us. The psalmist sang, The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, my life, of whom then shall I be afraid? Though an host of men were laid against me, yet shall not my heart be afraid, and though there rose up war against me, yet will I put my trust in him. These words of the well-loved 23rd Psalm also come to mind. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Where do we hear these assuring words in the confusion of today? In the church, in the churches, you say? Yes, we hear them day after day, week after week, and year after year. But do we really hear them? I am sure that many do not. I have been called upon hundreds of times to officiate at the funeral service of Roman Catholics who for one reason or another have been denied the services of their own church. I have frequently observed that the most devout are woefully lacking in understanding and reverence. Their whole attitude is one of deep fear and grief when their faith should cause them to feel the opposite, and to feel the opposite. It is only natural that we would weep at the passing of a loved one, but hopelessness and senseless grief is the utter denial of faith. I try to reason away their fears and blind grief, but seldom do I succeed. It is not words alone sympathy, that will ease the burning pain which sears the heart and mind when death has passed our way. It is only the inner surety that the eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. I do not like to say this, but it's we are awakened to the eternal hope which is planted in the heart and soul of man by his Creator. Furthermore, we must face all fears, and having exhausted all of our own strength, we come to the realization that the psalmist did when he wrote, I should utterly, I should utterly have fainted, but I believe verily to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Yes, there is one last hope in this world, and once we have lost that, we, are, we have truly lost everything, and without it, we... There is no darkness so deep, nor adversity so great, that cannot be alleviated when once we come to know, not just believe, that the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. There is no one on earth that can stand between us and stand between us and our own good once we place our dependence and our trust in the everlasting arms. When we come to face the last dark hour, what is it that alone can give us hope? 
It is not the promises of friends. It is not the wealth of this world, however vast it may be. There is no hope in this world at all to comfort us when we stand at the door of eternity. Our only hope lies in the future, and if we cannot see any possible gleam of life to give us a sign that there is life beyond, then we are dead indeed. Each one of us must face that, face that moment eventually, and there is no escape. As we await the approaching moment, void of any hope in this world, our only hope is, the eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And now, unto thee, O perfect one, the Lord and lover of men, do we commend our life and our hope. For thou art the heavenly bread, the life of the whole world. Thou art in all places and endurest all things the treasury of endless good, endless good, and the well of infinite compassion. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.